Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining our webinar today. Today, we are going to be taking the mystery out of micro-irrigation. Um, I'm Maggie Gone. I am the Water Conservation Program Assistant over at the Manatee County's Extension Office. And a big part of my job is doing the Mobile Irrigation Lab. We go to folks' residences and evaluate their irrigation and landscapes um, for water conservation, see how they can help us save water. And I guess we'll go ahead and get started. And thanks again for joining us today, everybody. So today we are going to talk about micro irrigation, obviously, um, but there are some other things that I wanted to touch base about. We're gonna discuss the utilities department's rebate program, watering restrictions, why we even bother to irrigate and choosing the right irrigation system. And of course, eventually we'll get to micro irrigation. All right, so the utilities department offers quite a few different rebate programs for their customers. So these that you see here are different rebate programs for your water sources. So if you decide to get a cistern or use a different water source or you're installing a well or gonna share a well with the community, they have rebates up to 50% of your price up to a certain point. Um, so there are some requirements for the rebate programs. You need to be a utilities customer. So you have to be receiving and paying for the Manatee County water. You have to own your own property and you must use, your property has to, have, this is kind of a weird qualification, but um, you have to have used an average of 8,500 gallons of water prior to March of 2003 in any six month period before that date. So if you don't know the answer to that, which most people don't, you could give us a call and we can help figure out if you may be qualified for any of these rebate programs. We can help in that way, but we are not the final decision makers. So the utilities department will ultimately tell you if you're approved for the rebate program or not. All right, so again, these are just some rebate programs for water sources. And here we have some of the most popular rebate programs, I would say. Um, these are the ones that we help them with. So how these work is the Mobile Irrigation Lab. It's myself and Valerie Massey. If anybody attended the webinar on Tuesday, that was my partner, Valerie. So we work together. She evaluates the landscape and I evaluate the irrigation. So what we do is we come out to your house, take an initial evaluation of the property, and then if you're deemed qualified for the rebate program, then you would make changes to the rain sensor or irrigation system repairs or replacements. And then we would come back out after you've done all of those fixes and give utilities the thumbs up or the thumbs down on whether or not you did make all the changes we recommended. Um, so, the biggest one that I think people should be taking advantage of is the rain sensor. A lot of folks have rain sensors, but a lot of them aren't functioning um, and they're fairly inexpensive to install. So if you're able to get a rebate of up to $125 and the install is around that, then you could not have to pay anything for that. And they help you save water, so why not? And I'll go more into the function of a rain sensor in a little bit here. And then this is all about the landscape retrofit. So if you decide to make some major landscape changes, they can also help you with that. Um, of course, because changing to some drought tolerant plants, Florida friendly plants, natives will help you conserve water because they're suited for our environment here and don't need as much water as some other traveling visitor plants may. All right, so question number one. Per our current water restrictions, do you know what your scheduled watering days and times are? Scheduled watering days are determined based off of your house number. So if your address ends with an odd or even number, that is your, that's going to be what tells you what days you are. So Odd number houses 
you are allowed to water Wednesday and or Saturday. Even numbers, you are allowed to water Thursday and or Sunday. Now I say and or because really we recommend that you water once a week. You don't want to overwater. So once a week, giving your lawn a great run will do it some justice and it'll be just fine. And watering times, you do not want to water between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., but we highly, highly recommend that you are watering early morning time, so around 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. period. All right, so why do we need to maintain proper irrigation practices? Why do we even bother irrigating our plants in our lawn? Well, Florida is a land of weather extremes. It's either super duper hot or super duper wet. And our soils have great drainage. So we typically have sandy soils and the water drains right through them. Um, and a lot of the time we also have poor drainage. Um, a lot of new developments are experiencing more clay in their soils and that soil is getting compacted and there's not as much drainage as there would be in like a sandy soil. And a lot of landscapes unfortunately contain plants that aren't adapted to Florida. So this picture here on the right, I believe these are some petunias and they are being irrigated because they aren't used to Florida. They're not really suited for our climate. They prefer something a little more cold and dry. So it's just kind of a waste of water to have to keep watering these flowers when we have some beautiful natives and Florida friendlies that could replace those and you wouldn't have to worry about irrigating them as much. Um, and we need to maintain proper practices because potable water is a non-renewable resource. Um, you know, a lot of these houses, older houses, and even some newer ones, they use potable water to irrigate. Um, so that is our drinking water, and we don't really want to have our lawn drink our resource that could be providing drinking water to people. And outdoor water use accounts for up to half of the public publicly supplied drinking water in Florida. So that is telling us that we are using a lot of water outside. Um, so being aware of what's going on in our yard and with our irrigation system will definitely help us conserve water and help us save it. All right, and of course, it's okay to turn your system off. It's okay to turn it on when it is very dry and your yard needs some hydration, but really it's okay to turn it off too. Don't forget that. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the rainy season, we definitely recommend that you turn your irrigation system off. We get a lot of rain. Um, so if you're receiving about three-fourths of an inch to an inch of water a week, your lawn will be good for that week. So even though a lot of us have the rain sensors, having one of those handy-dandy rain gauges that you see here on the right um, will be really helpful just to keep a kind of reminder of that we have rain and how much you receive. Um, so let your lawn tell you when to water. Pay attention to signs of over underwatering. You know, when you see your grass blades are all folded up and they're turning to like a gray blue color, or you can still see footprints in your yard, you know, then maybe turn on the irrigation system and give it a run. Um, but during the cooler months, your lawn doesn't need water every week like in the rainy season. So just really pay attention to what's going on outside and turn it off when it needs to. Because also if you overwater your lawn, that can also create pests and disease in your turf and plants. So just be aware that overwatering is not is never the answer. <laughs> All right, so to the rain sensors. So this is a Florida statute. Everybody who has an in-ground irrigation system is required to have a rain shutoff device. So whether that be a soil moisture sensor that you see in that top image or a weather station that's pulling data from a nearby 
local weather station and shutting off your system as need be, or just, you know, your typical rain sensor, which are also great. So I'm going to repeat myself. These are required by law. Obviously, we're the mobile irrigation lab. We are there to educate you on water conservation. We're not going to enforce anything. We're not going to slap you on the wrist or anything like that, but you need to have these. They're super important. Um, and another, the main reason why we need to conserve water and, you know, pay attention to what we're doing and our effects on the environment is we have had major, major geographical changes in Florida um, within just a few decades. So on the left there, you can see that's the Bayshore Gardens area in 1940. There is barely any development there. You can see spots of um, wetlands and things of that nature. And then over in 2020, it's about covered in concrete, whether they're homes or roads. Um, you do see a few stormwater ponds, but not as not any wetlands. And our wetlands are super important to us because they are like the kidneys of our water system. So when the hydrologic cycle filters that water back into the wetlands, the wetlands will filter all of that impurities um, that is being brought into our water by runoff. Um, so things like your pesticides, um, fertilizers, and things like that. Our wetlands actually help with cleaning our water. So we do want to keep some of them around. But I just wanted to bring this to everybody's attention. I know that we all have seen these changes, but it's just important to realize that we do have an effect on the environment, even if it's just us, even if it's just the one neighbor, the one house in the neighborhood that's conserving water, at least someone's doing it and helping. So you matter. And of course, the water in the world looks like it's abundant and we will never run out of it. Um, but 90% of the Earth's water is actually salt water. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't really care for drinking salt water. Um, <laughs> and desalination is very energy inefficient and expensive. Um, and two thirds of all of the fresh water is frozen in glaciers. So, you know. I know that climate change is happening and things are melting, but it's not helping us. It's not a great thing. <laughs> so 1% of the water on Earth is potable and we're using that to water our lawns. So just some food for thought. Think about if you'd rather have drinking water, watering your lawn. So why irrigate? Well. We do like to have pretty lawns. We like to see butterflies and birds enjoying our plants and everything like that. So we want to keep it healthy, right? So water does leave plants fairly quickly in Florida due to evaporation. We have that intense heat. So sometimes we do need to help out our plants in our lawn if we aren't getting enough rainfall. Now, rain should be your number one water source and you use irrigation as needed. Irrigation systems have always meant to be supplemental to rainfall. So this is not to replace rain or to pretend that rain isn't happening. Your irrigation system should only be on if we don't receive enough rain. So a well-planned, planned, I'm sorry, <laughs> a well-planned and maintained watering system will encourage healthy plant growth will conserve you water and it'll make your gardening life much easier. So I think that we all want to do those things. So definitely plan out your irrigation system and have the right things in the right places. So to begin with your system, start with the basics. Just think about what kind of plants you want. If you have shade in your lawn, if you have full sun, um, that will really help you to determine how much your plants, how much water plants really need. Um, and also some other factors that will help 
with your watering requirements is soil structure, soil texture, and your plant needs. So whether, you, whether or not you have compacted soil or if you have very sandy soil that drains quickly, um, these are things to just think of. All right, and a little bit more about soil textures. So on the left here, we have clay and doesn't really allow water to penetrate too much. Um, typically will stay towards the surface and that encourages your plants to have shallow roots if the water is just at the top. Um, if roots are chasing water towards the bottom like they do in loam or sandy soils, they will typically be more resilient having those deeper root structures. Um, ideally, you would like a combination of all of these soils, um, primarily loam and then sand and then clay. Um, and then we'll go a little bit more into this. So you can see this nice diagram over to the left goes over the granules of these different soil types. So obviously gravel's huge. You don't want to use gravel really in your landscape because um, gravel, if it's made of rock, will heat up those roots and that's will evaporate the water. So you don't really want to do that. But clay, silt, sand, all different sizes. Sand is obviously a little bit bigger, so that's why it drains quicker. All right. And then why is this important? So like I said, it determines how the water will penetrate the soil and it determines how much water will remain in the soil. So on the left, you see some clay. And sometimes when you go to water things that would have clay soils or your turf is planted in the clay soil, um, it's like when you're watering a plant and then the water just spills over. So sometimes it might be nice to do a short water really quick to let everything get kind of moist and then go ahead and do another water so that things can penetrate a little bit better. Um, medium so loam soil and then loose sandy soil. So you can see the sandy soil drains pretty, pretty great. So that loam soil in the middle there is kind of ideal. And also you can do things to improve your soil. So I would definitely consider composting. Um, so compost is created when microorganisms break down organic matter like leaves, grass clippings, and kitchen waste. Um, compost will improve the health of your soil. It's adding you know, more nutrients than what was already there. And this will improve the structure of sandy and clay soils. So that's kind of bringing in more of that loam texture. And this will yeah, provide your plant with nutrients. So um, we just started composting at my house and it was a pretty easy setup. And I've been able to put all of my ends of the broccoli stalks and lettuce heads all in the compost. So it feels good to not have to throw out everything to the landfill, but I also am creating a great soil to help um, enrich my plants. So definitely consider it. All right. So more about choosing your irrigation system. So some factors are to size. Obviously size will impact how much you water or how much you don't water. Um, the height and the density of plants, how many plants you have. You have just one plant there. I mean, you don't really need to install any sprinklers there if it's just one plant. <laughs> um, slope. So if you have um, some slope downhill run into the road, you don't necessarily, you might want to put your sprinklers at the top of it so that it, the water runs down the whole yard. Um, soil type traffic patterns, maintenance requirements, your water source, its location and pressure, um, and cost. So before we get into micro-irrigation, we're going to talk about some other types of irrigation. Hand watering, old school. 
So this gives you the ability to water small areas. It's a little bit easier to apply liquid fertilizers and you can be a little bit more precise about it as well. This will help you to wash your plants a little bit better, help you eyeball those insects and remove them if they're bad ones. Um, and this just allows for you to get a better look of your plants, get to know them a little more. Um, but it does provide inconsistent coverage. Um, I have a lot of potted plants and I hand water them and I, you know, miss the watering days sometimes. Um, they go a little bit longer without water sometimes because I forget. So, you know, there are its benefits, there are its disadvantages. So to each their own. And of course, garden hoses, you can use a hose to water your plants. Um, you might want to pay attention to the material of your hose because that will affect the durability, the flexibility, the weight, and the kinks of it. Um, and then make sure it has brass fittings. That's going to um, leak less than other fittings may. So some garden hose materials. I did want to point out the top right there, that picture. It's like a metal hose. Um, I've seen that at some people's houses and these are fantastic. Um, they're very lightweight and they're durable. Um, and I thought being in the sun, they would get really hot, but they actually, it actually was cool to the touch. So I was really impressed with these hoses. They were really easy to use. So I'd recommend that hose. I don't have one personally, but I've seen some in the field. Um, so unreinforced vinyl hose, those are your most inexpensive. Um, they, they are light, but they're more prone to the kinking, not as durable. Um, your rubber hose, that's your most durable. Um, it's heavy and it's probably one of the more pricey ones you'll see out there. And then you have your reinforced vinyl rubber. It's flexible, durable, um, but not as heavy or expensive as the rubber option would be. And hose guides. Oh, sorry. So the hose guides are just what they sound like. You can put little guides out there for your hose. Um, they have some really cute ones out there. I like the little mushroom ones. Those are sweet. Um, then you can get just the simple stakes. Um, so if you want your hose just to be in a certain place in your yard at all times, you can use these guides to help keep it in place and to also bring attention to it so that your landscaper or you don't run over it with the lawnmower. Um, and of course there's hose attachments. So you have hose end nozzles. We've all seen that one on the bottom left there, that green one, just the little handle where you can change the settings. Um, but then there are some other ones that are longer. Um, and some of these do help with the pressure um, and of course they have all those fancy settings as well. And you have a deep root irrigator, you hook your hose up to that. And, you know, if you don't want to install a whole sprinkler system, you can go around and poke that in your turf and water it that way so that you're just getting to the roots and not on the foliage. And then also there's quick couplers that you can hook up to your hose or your hose bits. Um, this can connect two hoses together, or you can just put it at the base of where your hose is getting its water from to help with any pressure. And then also there's portable sprinklers. Um, I, you know, I do want to say that the hose is still using potable water, so you still want to be careful with all of these options that I'm showing you right now. You don't want to overdo it with these because it's still the same water that would be from your irrigation system, most likely. Um, but these are portable sprinklers, so you can see how they are attached to one another. And you can just kind of stick them around, make patterns in your lawn. Um, so you just want to make sure that the coverage and pattern match the area to be watered. If you're watering around tall plants or objects, get a sprinkler designed to sit on a tripod or stand. Kind of like these blue ones you see there, There's a little, they're a little bit taller. 
Um, and obviously metal or high impact sprinklers are gonna be more durable than a, a plastic option. And then choose sprinklers with nozzles or emitters over punched holes for these portable sprinklers. <clears throat> All right, and then we have the oscillating sprinklers. This is what I use in my yard. I don't have much grass. Um, our yard is kind of half mulch, half turf grass. Um, and so we use one of these and it, it works out just fine for us. Um, so this is a good option for open areas with limited obstructions. Um, so if you have like a statue in the middle of your yard or branches, um, big branches from the oak trees or pine trees, it's a great option for those. Um, it can cover large areas, but one negative thing is water is lost to evaporation and wind. So anytime water is going up high, um, you know, there is a really great chance that wind and evaporation can move that and take it away from the target, which is your turf or plants. Um, so just uh, make sure when you put it out there, you are kind of watching its pattern and seeing where it's actually going rather than just placing it out there and walking away. All right, and traveling sprinklers. I have never seen these before, but they look really fun. Um, <laughs> I'd imagine if you had kids, it'd be pretty fun to play with in the yard. So, these can rotate, but mainly they travel along your hose and they provide fairly uniform coverage because they do travel. But depending on where you put them, they could be hitting hard surfaces. So they may waste water in that sense. But um, yeah, I, this looks kind of neat. So I might think about getting one of these for my little yard, but um, this is another option for you. All right, and then also manual timers. I think we've all have been guilty of accidentally leaving something on and forgetting about it. Um, so manual timers come in handy because you can set it for 50 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever, and it'll shut off. So you can see on the right there, they connect to the hose bib, or you can just have one that's built into your oscillating sprinkler. Um, tons of options for you. So if you are going to use hose as your primary water source, um, you may want to think about getting one of these. All right, and of course, the permanent sprinklers. So the rotors and spray heads. So these are usually part of automatic watering systems. So a lot of the times these are already in our lawns when we buy our homes. Um, but you can see them on risers, which are above ground. People tend to put sprinklers on risers as their plants grow taller and taller. But like I said before, that's not necessarily the best case scenario because of wind and evaporation can cause major water loss. Um, so they can be good for areas of low traffic um, and they are fairly easy to install and to fix and to make taller or shorter. Um, and then your pop-ups, that top right one you see, they are underground. Um, you definitely wanna put those concrete donuts around them so that your landscaper or you remember where it is um, when you're taking care of your yard. Um, and this will pop up when the water turns on because the pressure just enacts that spring and just pops it right up. Um, so this is good for your typical lawn. It's good for higher areas of traffic. And this, it looks nice because they go back in the ground and then you don't have to look at them all the time. All right, so a little bit more about these guys. So your spray heads, they um, emit the irrigation out of fixed spray. So the nozzle on top of your sprinkler head, you can adjust that or depending on what type of nozzle it is, um, but they can shoot 
at any degree angle, typically um, it's 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees. Um, but it's, I definitely recommend these. If you do want a sprinkler system, spray heads are probably going to be the most efficient for Florida yard, the average Florida yard. Um, the rotary heads that you see at the bottom, the rotors, those rotate and they emit the irrigation as like a rotating stream. And that's going to be a lot better for big open areas. Um, definitely don't want to water your driveway with that. So the spray heads would be a little bit more efficient if your yard is a little smaller or you have some landscape beds that kind of make your lawn a interesting shape. Um, the spray heads don't require as much pressure as the rotors do. Um, so that's another perk with the spray heads. You don't have to worry too much about the pressure. Um, but yeah, so these are also an option for you if you want permanent sprinklers in your yard. All right, and now for the main event, micro. Um, so this image, you can see all the different um, ways you can use micro irrigation. All right. All right, so micro irrigation. Um, I love this picture of this yard because you can see their emitters pretty easily here. So there's some over here by the driveway, but then you can also see one over there against the house. Um, so micro irrigation is what we love to see in the landscape beds. So what exactly is micro irrigation? So micro irrigation is a way to water plants using low pressure and low flow rates. So you're not going to be using as much water as you would with those spray heads and rotors. Um, usually it uses about 15 PSI and emits about 60 gallons per hour or less, um, which is much less than those other heads. Um, this applies small quantities of water directly to the root zone. So you're not getting as much water on the foliage, which a lot of landscape plants don't necessarily love. So just getting water to that important zone, the root zone. Um, so these systems can be pretty easy to install above or below or on, you know, landscape beds, whether it's on the soil or the mulch. And this emits water as tiny drops, tiny streams, or mini sprays. There's different types that you can choose from. And of course, I'm going to go a little bit further into detail about that. Okay, so this is the typical... Oh, fancy. I didn't realize it was going to do that. <laughs> um, so this is the typical layout and what we like to see in these areas. So potted plants definitely recommend for you to hand water those as needed. Um, potted plants are usually those really pretty attractive plants, so we can definitely tell when they need some water because those leaves will start wilting and um, whatnot. Landscape beds use the micro irrigation as needed. This yard, um, they have some established shrubs and they have that palmetto, so they don't necessarily need that micro irrigation, but they may want to for those smaller plants that they have in their landscape or any of those flowering plants that might need some extra water. Um, turf grass areas use spray heads or rotors if your yard is, you know, large enough. If the turf grass area is small, maybe you don't need to worry about installing spray heads and rotors and using all of that water for a tiny area. Um, but it's your call, but this is what we're recommending. All right, so micro irrigation. Um, these are pictures of my brother's bonsai garden. I had my dad take these for me yesterday to put in here. Um, so you can see they have their little emitters here um, and the drip tube going along here um, leading to the emitters. Um, so he's using micro for his bonsais because they are his babies. <laughs> Um, so micro irrigation can also be known as drip irrigation. So this operates at the lower pressure, like I said before, and 
This you can use in different, a few different ways. So you can use it in small narrow gardens um, or, you know, nurseries and commercial gardens use micro irrigation to water their plants and keep them looking pretty. Um, if you have container gardens, um, you know, if you have a big, huge um, container full of herbs and pretty things like that, um, you might want to install a little micro um, irrigation system in that. Hanging baskets, yeah, you can throw some micro in there. I, personally, I don't think it's necessary, but to each their own. Um, and of course, the landscape beds, definitely, definitely landscape beds. All right, so advantages of micro irrigation. There's wide variety of uses. This is an efficient and reduced use of water. Uh, that's probably my favorite part of micro is you're using less water. Um, less weed growth because typically with micro you're not overwatering and welcoming those weeds to pop up. Um, micro can be automated and reduce pet pro pest problems. Um, so, you know, without overwatering, you're not encouraging all these pests to come make their homes in this wet, soggy soil. Um, it's, it's great for that. Um, some disadvantages of micro is some of the parts and installation can tend to get a little pricey and the pieces are smaller um, and they can get a little, some can be a little flimsy, so higher maintenance at times with micro irrigation is a problem. Um, you definitely need to make sure that you are using quality filtration because of those emitters. They're a much smaller hole for the water to get through rather than a spray head or a rotor. So the water really needs to be filtered out and cleaned really well for it to come out properly. Um, can be a little tricky to install micro irrigation. Um, and because it is so small and can be fragile, it can be easily damaged. So if you have a big dog and he goes running in your landscape beds, you can't be too mad at him for knocking over the micro because they are a little delicate, but they can easily be damaged. Um, so the components of a micro irrigation system, your control valve, so that's if it's automated um, and you have it hooked up to your irrigation controller. Um, backflow preventer, so that's the anti-siphoning device, so that is not allowing the irrigation water to be washed back into your water system and into your potable system that's going into your house. Um, pressure regulators, making sure that things aren't getting too much pressure and just popping off. Um, filters, tubing, fittings, stakes, and emitters. Um, we're gonna go into each of these a little bit. All right, so here are some varieties of micro-irrigation emitters. So there's different types of micro you can have in your landscape bed. So you can have the drip tubing that you see there on the top right. That little hole is where the water will come out. On to the top left, the micro sprayers spray in a, it's a little spray, hint, micro sprayer, it's just what it sounds like. Um, drippers, this just drips out water. This one, it seems to be streaming out, but typically they drip and it's just a little water at a time. Drip, drip, drip. Um, there are shrub, shrublers or micro bubblers. Um, that's what my brother has in his little bonsai garden. And so those will let out a little bit more water. Um, all right. And so connecting to a hose bib, there are ways that you can do that with, if you just want micro, um, or if your current irrigation system you have doesn't have enough zones to put a micro zone on there for your landscape beds. Um, here is how you can do that. So you would just need the filter and adapter and hook up your drip tubing. And I would definitely recommend putting a timer in here as well so that you're not running your micro all through the night and forget about it because typically you can't see it too well.
All right. Do, do, do. So this is the distribution tubing. That is the main source of the water for the micro irrigation system. And then you have your spaghetti tubing, um, your drip tube. That is the source. That's where the water is. That's how the water is being transported to your emitter. Um, support stake. You might need this. You definitely will need this for some of these emitters to make sure that they're hitting their target. And your emitter. There's a bunch of different types of emitters. And like I said, we'll go a little bit deeper into that. All right, so filters. Filters are really important to any irrigation system, whether it's micro or it's your spray heads or rotors. Um, you wanna make sure that they're not getting clogged because then your water won't be emitting correctly. Um, so because the irrigation water must pass through the emitters, the size of the particles in the water must be smaller than the size of the emitter to prevent clogging. <clears throat> So screen filters, um, typically mesh. You have inline filters that are the least expensive option for you. Um, and you need to take the apart the water line to clean. You have the Y and T filters, easy removal for cleaning, and some come with flush valves, which is nice. So on the left there, you can see different pictures of the filters being used and some images of the filters. And some more filters for your viewing pleasure. Um, so you can see how some of them are in line, some are right at that water source. Um, so like that top right image, they just you can screw it off. You would take out the little basket and clean that out. All right, and pressure regulators. Um, so this is installed in line with the system and it regulates water pressure at a given water flow used to prevent fittings from blowing apart. So if you have a sprinkler, spray head, or you know an emitter that can't handle such high pressure, sometimes it'll just get blown off. The nozzle will just fly off the top of it if the pressure is too high. <laughs> um, we don't want any geysers, so uh, make sure that your pressure is correct. Um, so this allows for your water devices to work properly. And most are plastic, and are preset to maintain 15 to 30 PSI. Um, there's also brass systems that are adjustable and you can connect this to piping or hose bib as well. Um, and I just like this picture because it kind of put everything together for us. So you get your filter and then you have your pressure regulator and then that is going out to your drip tube. So I thought this was a pretty cool image. All right, so drip tubing. So emitters are actually installed inside the tubing. So it's not like holes were just poked. There's actually some science behind it. They um, have special emitters in there that make sure that that water is coming out of that hole. Emitters are pressure compensating. Fewer parts and pieces because it's just the tube and generally they're out of sight. So like this top picture here, they have it on top of the soil and then they're probably going to put about two inches of mulch, I'd say, on there. Um, and so then those drip lines will be buried. And these are great because they really just get to that root zone. Yep, dry foliage, wet root zone and it creates a row of wet circles. So the picture below, um, I kind of liked how it just showed you the placement of the tubing like around the tree and it's around the landscape bed. So typically doing the circles will make sure that everything, all the roots get wet of the landscape plants or if you do want to water a tree, that will work too. All right, so microtubing. So this uses a PVC to connect water source to control valves and anywhere pressure is above 30 PSI. So the drip tubing is usually made out of 
polyethylene, it's UV resistant um, with 15 to 25 year lifespan. So that's pretty great. It's flexible and it's easy to cut, uh, can be covered with mulch or buried a few inches underground, usually in half inch diameter, though it can vary. And you, typically it's sold in rolls of 50 to 500 feet. So inside the drip tubing, um, like I said, there's the special emitters in there that make sure that water is coming out of that hole. Um, but it's also pressure compensating. So it's making sure that it's coming out at a specified amount and timing. Um, so that it really is just a drip, 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 and not just a stream of water pouring out. All right, so great picture. You can really see those emitters. Um, and if you look, you can kind of see how, you can kind of see the emitters through the tubing. It's not smooth like it is here. You can see that there is something built in there to make sure that that water is coming out precisely. And another image of that circular pattern for your landscape beds to ensure root zones are getting wet. All right, um, this is also another way you can do it is hooking it up to the PVC pipe and create kind of a manifold. Um, and you can do it in lines. You don't have to do the circular pattern. You just wanna make sure that everything is getting good coverage. Um, like you can see in this circle here, this shows where the emitters are and they're overlapping, which is good. So just make sure that you are just placing enough drip tube in there to actually take care of all of those root zones. All right, and microtubing. So this is what we like to call spaghetti tubing. Um, this is typically what is connecting the emitter to the water source. And this is also made out of the polyethylene um, or it can be made out of a heavyweight vinyl. Um, but this is used in the container plantings that you see at that, that top left picture there of the roses. Um, and it's used to place the emitters out of it at individual plants. So if you have some really special plants that you want to make sure are getting water, you would get the microtubing to lead up to that plant. And here are different fittings that you can use um, on the microtubing or on the drip line. So you have the couplings um, and those are joining two sections of the tubing together. So that's definitely an important one if you need to be making your lines and your tubings longer. Um, T's, they will branch off the drip line or the drip tubing into different directions. Elbows, you also need this if you need to make some corners. And then adapters. So this is where the tubing or um, pipe will connect to the PVC pipe or the hose bib, whatever it may be. So you can see that and would take the hose and then this, you would put the little drip tube in there. All right, and then barbed fitting. So there's a tool, that was a couple slides back. So this tool by this guy's hand here, you poke holes in the drip tube and then you are able to poke in different um, emitters um, and this will force the fitting into the tubing using a barbed fitting after you poke that hole in there. And then of course we have different emitters. So this offers precise water placement. This, these can have volumes of half to two gallons per hour. Higher volume bubblers spread water better in sandy soils. And you can really choose your spacing as needed with these. So you can really, really customize your landscape bed, your container gardens to what they need. There is an emitter for all of them. 
So you have a little dripper here. You have a shrubler up there, another drip there. Um, and these are really easy to change out too. Most of them you just screw right off and then just screw another one on. All right, so micro sprays. These are really cute. They look like miniature sprinklers. <laughs> um, these are not as precise as the drip emitters um, because typically they're on the stakes. And like I mentioned, you know, if your dog is in a landscape bed and accidentally knocks one over, you know, then it's not going to hit its target because it's on the ground and not facing the plant that you put it in front of. Um, this they do apply more water than the drip tube. And you can use these in closely spaced plantings, um, like ground covers and flower beds. These are great for, um, good for watering tree and shrub root zones. And you need to overlap the sprays for uniform com coverage if you are using it in a landscape bed and you want to make sure all of the root zone is getting covered. You want to make sure you have enough in there that they overlap and you're not missing any plants. So if you have a landscape bed and there's one plant that just really isn't thriving, you may need to make sure it's getting um, water like the rest of the bed. Um, you know, the higher you put it to the sky, the more subject it is going to be to evaporation and wind. So just be weary of that. And you just need to adjust it as the plants grow. Um, so if it's growing over it, you might want to move it. Um, so just be careful putting it up too high is all I'm going to say. Um, but I do like these guys and I think they're great um, when people do have them in their landscape beds. Um, you also can retrofit your existing sprinklers to micro irrigation. How cool is that? Um, so I love these guys. They look like octopus. Um, really cool. So you can um, unscrew the nozzle for your spray head sprinkler or your rotor head and there's other ones that you can screw on there and then you would li link or um, connect the micro tubing to those pieces that are emitting water. Um, so I think this is awesome. I think these are really cool. Um, there's even ones where you can hook up the drip lining um, so this is really cool. So I highly recommend doing this if you right now have sprinklers in your landscape bed. I would definitely get one of these guys and um, hook it up to micro, um, especially if it, they're flowering plants. They're plants that do need that irrigation. If they're established shrubs, I wouldn't res really recommend doing it. Um, you could just cap those heads, but if you have really pretty landscape plants with a sprinkler that's really hitting them hard, I would retrofit that to the micro. Um, so the internet can definitely help you find where to get these, but um, they should be at your local hardware stores too. Um, and of course, drip kits. Um, so this you can, can these are for connecting to like a hose bib. So if you don't have a zone dedicated for micro or that you can switch to micro, you may wanna consider one of these if you need it. Um, so these are convenient for smaller areas. So you do decide to do that um, container garden. This might be an option for you, um, but it can be constraining because they're not as big and you don't get as many items in them. Um, you're not getting as many emitters, but you can always buy more pieces, but so this is also an option if you just want like a mini micro irrigation setup. And of course, with everything, there's maintenance. Um, so make sure you are regularly flushing the lines, check emitters for blockage. Um, make sure your filters are nice and clean. Uh, I would probably clean the filters monthly and, you know, check for clogged emitters. I can never say this enough look at your irrigation system watch it run you know if you have some drip tube maybe dig up a little emitter and see if it's really dripping out or um you know if you're walking around your yard and there's puddling of water be weary of that that might be an indicator that you have some sort of breaker leak going on so with all this maintenance make sure just to 
kind of take a peek. Get a little wet, put on your swimsuit and go play in your sprinklers and just check out your system, make sure it's working properly. Um, and of course, you know, keep an eye on your plants. Um, they grow, they grow big, um, some of them, most of them. So just make sure that you are adjusting your emitters um, as that plant grows. And use water wisely. I do want to explain these pictures I have on this slide. <laughs> um, so this is, these are images from um, school kids. So the utilities department has a, a water conservation drawing contest every year. And so these are some of the kids that participated and uh, they were some of my favorites. I like this one with the heart it says roses are red, violets are blue. I save water and money too. Um, I just thought these were adorable. Um, so, you know, kids are learning about conserving water. So we should be a great example and show them how. Um, so use water wisely when irrigating, um, even when you're using micro irrigation, we may think, oh, well, micro doesn't use as much water, but you're still using water. Um, so just be mindful. Um, so water efficiently, plant an irrigation zone so you don't have to use a different source of water every time. Um, mulch, mulch in your landscape beds. Um, mulch is great. It helps to keep the water there. It helps keep things moist so you don't have to water as frequently. Um, it's not going to dry out as quick um, if you have some mulch down. Plant water efficient or drought tolerant plants. Um, it's Florida. A lot of our natives, Florida friendlies, are drought tolerant typically. Um, so just be mindful of that. If they don't require water, you don't need to water them. Improve your soil conditions like with composting. Better your soil is, the better your plants will be. Remove weeds that are stealing water. Um, you know, we see that Biden's alba. Biden's alba is a beautiful plant. It's the white flower with the yellow center. Um, it's actually a great plant and a lot of us think they're weeds, but not necessarily. So if you see that popping up in your grass, maybe leave that, but all other weeds <laughs> uh, you can probably take out. Um, apply water only to your plant's root zone. And that goes for all plants. They really just want the water in their roots. Um, that's what really keeps them healthy. All right, so efficient watering. So ideally you want three fourths of an inch of water per week um, throughout your turf for your plants. Um, and if you're overdoing that, you may want to be a little weary to do that. Um, overwatering can kill your plants just as easy as underwatering can. Uh, measure the output of your sprinklers. Make sure that you're not overwatering or underwatering. Um, water in the early morning to avoid excess ev evaporation. Water according to your plant needs, not just to set schedule. Um, if you give us a call at the Mobile Irrigation Lab here, we can help you set a schedule um, that will suit your water, your plant's water needs. Um, and we also go based off the size, so um, feel free to call us and set an appointment. We can definitely help you out with this. Um, have a functioning rain sensor that's going to shut off your irrigation when we're getting enough rain. So it's really your friend. You're also going to be saving money um, if your rain sensor is shutting off your system when it's raining. Um, and avoid irrigating in the rainy season. Of course, if your rain sensor is functioning, it'll shut it off for you. Um, and then, of course, again, call Mobile Irrigation Lab. Have us come out and evaluate your system and landscape. It is a free service. All right, and these are some pictures. Um, I might zoom through some of them, but I just thought it was kind of cool how um, they showed the assembly of some micro. So there's your connector that's gonna connect to the drip tube, um, to a hose bib or the water source. That's your tubing. Okay, we're attaching it now. 
There it goes. It's on. All right. And this is the guy we use to poke holes in the tubing. Poking holes. All right. Now this is going to go into the tube. And that is our um, little barbed piece that's going in. And this piece um, is used to clamp. So if you want to do an end there, clamp. And that's your little emitter. Um, there's a wide variety of these um, that will emit different spray patterns. Bingo. All right, and these are just pictures of different emitters. You can see um, on the top here the different shapes and things. All right, and of course, if you poked one too many holes in your tube, you can put in one of these little pieces as a stopper. And so that will just kind of clog up that hole and won't let any water out. All right, and that is all I have for you today. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. I hope you learned something new. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, please, please um, ask them. Um, I did want to give you guys some sources for some further information. Um, we have all of our UF extension publications are available to you. Um, you can go to this edis.ifis.ufl.edu and you can enter your question there or the topic that you want to learn more about and it'll generate some publications and articles for you. Or what I find myself doing a lot is I just go to Google and I type in the subject like micro irrigation. And if you just put UF at the end of it, it'll bring you to our publications. Um, so type in anything with UF at the end and you should be able to find what you're looking for. Um, these are irrigation manufacturer websites. So if you wanna look at anything they have, and then of course, if you want to know your watering restrictions, go to watermatters.org. That is the Southwest Florida Water Management District. And they are the government entity that makes all of our water restrictions. All right, and this is your sign to inspect your irrigation system and to book an appointment with the Mobile Irrigation Lab. Um, Valerie and myself are really happy to come out and meet you and take a look at what you have going on and to help you. We want to help you conserve water. We want to help you save money. Um, we're also pretty nice too, so um, please uh, give us a call. Book an appointment. Uh, Michelle Atkinson is my boss. She is the Environmental Horticulture Agent 2 here. She oversees our little division we have. Um, and here is my phone number with my extension. Below you can find our emails. So if you have any questions, um, email is the best way to get a hold of me because I am out in the field sometimes. Um, it is easier for me to respond to emails. Again, thank you so much for joining us today. I greatly appreciate you all coming, um, and we hope to see you soon.